Hey everyone, welcome to week 70. This is day five. This is our final day on our Tackle It week. I think we've been uh, really good. You know, <laughs> we've lost all the fear that we had when tackling hands. So let's see if we can finish strong and just paint like a super nice expressive hand. Okay, let's get started. This is Friday. This is our last day. This is our fifth day on our ongoing Tackle It week. And the subject matter that we've decided to tackle for this week has been hands. And I know this is something that currently perhaps doesn't give me too much trouble. Although I'm going to argue that every single time I sit down and paint, I sit down and draw, whatever it is, it's always going to be challenging. It's always going to be tough. We can get used to something being tough, being challenging. It doesn't mean that we're comfortable doing it. If you are not concentrated while doing whatever subject matter you feel confident with, it's not going to come out right. I probably have painted and drawn maybe thousands of portraits. But if I don't keep an eye on the ball, if I'm not totally concentrated on what I'm doing, that one time that I'm just not willing to put in the hard work, it's going to be off. It's going to give me a ton of trouble. And the painting experience is going to be frustrating. So I'm always very aware of the fact that painting can come back and bite you in the ass if you're not willing to be present while you're painting. So maybe hands right now for me are enjoyable. You know, I'm not going to say they're easy. I'm going to say that I look forward to the chance, the opportunity that I get when I have to paint a hand. Like that's something that excites me. But it wasn't true from the beginning. I mean... I can tell you right now that it was painful, it was horrifying, it was so scary that I told you guys how I constructed in my brain so many excuses to not deal with the hands that years went by where I was doing paintings that were completely lost opportunities to understand what hands meant to me, to understand their potential as the incredibly expressive tools that they are. So it is sad when you look back and you say, wow, I could have tried to do this sooner. I could have tried to push myself a little bit more when I was younger. And I'm not saying like, oh, where would I be now? No, 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 no. It's just that those years, I know that I was just hiding behind the fact that I didn't want to deal with the hands. Now that I'm older, I've learned that only good things, only good things can happen when you decide enough is enough. And we turn the page and you say, you know, from here on, I'm going to deal with these things that are my shortcomings. I'm going to deal with these irrational fears. I want to uncover what they mean to me and how I would solve them. Like I've said during this week, how I would show up in my paintings, how I can understand them as excuses to speak about a facet of my sensibility. Nowadays, I understand that those things are far more important and they outweigh whatever reasons that we can make up in our head and we can convince ourselves for not doing those subject matters, for not wanting to deal with those subject matters. It's not easy. It's not easy. I think the point of this week is not to say, hey, if you want it badly enough, you're going to get there super quickly. No, no. It's going to take time and it's going to take hard work. And there's going to be, like I said, dozens of paintings where... You just question yourself. You're just saying, why am I wanting to paint this? You know, why do I want to do this? Every single time that I've tried to paint it with this new mentality, the painting still comes out like crap. Everything comes out wrong. And that's inevitable. I'm guessing that there's special people out there and they have an enormous amount of ability and they can say, oh, I'm going to try to paint, you know, X, Y, or Z subject matter. And they get a hang of it super quickly. And, you know, it's going to be like hours of suffering as opposed to the months that we all other regular human beings suffer. But those people are extraordinary. Their ability may piss us off, but honestly, we should celebrate them. We should celebrate them because they are special people. They're capable of doing things that we can't. And we should be happy that they exist doing stuff that we're not capable of doing. Every time I see a painter, for example, we got Zoe Frank's uh, new catalog. Every time I see Zoe's work, I mean, she makes me push. But the good thing is, nowadays I understand that she makes me push not so I can become like her, not so I can paint like her, because that's what she's here in this universe for. Zoe is here to paint like Zoe. She makes me push in the sense that I want to see 
how much I can uncover about myself through painting. I have a thirst for that. I have a need for that now. This has become my path, my life. So whenever I see Zoe's paintings, I'm blown away because she has to be one of the most talented contemporary figurative painters out there. But at no point, I'm like, oh, I want to paint Zoe's paintings. I want to paint, for example, those window paintings that she's amazing at painting. Incredible work. No, years ago, I realized, you know what? Don't kill yourself trying to paint other people's work. Just sit back for a couple of minutes, for some hours, days, weeks, however long it takes you to interiorize their work. You know, feel like you're on vacation and just enjoy it. Enjoy that ride. You know, in the end, we're going to be grateful that people like Zoe, for example, exist and they're doing amazing work. You know, we're all the richer for it. We're all the better for it. So like I said, sit back, celebrate, applaud their efforts, recognize their talent, their sacrifice, their hard work, and then embark on your path once again, invigorated by, you know, all that you have seen with the hopes of uncovering new, exciting things. That's what amazing people do to us. They just give us energy. Yesterday, I was saying how it just seems ridiculous to pair Jerome Witkin with Jack Kirby, but my rediscovering and relearning of Jack Kirby, it's so exciting for me because I have no idea what sort of work that's going to produce. And I'm not saying that in a couple of months, it's like, oh, I can sense the Jack Kirby-ness in here. Like, I could totally get it. No, I don't know how it's going to show up. The most predictable way would be for my paintings to start looking like his drawings, and I have no interest in that. But I do know that I want his influence in my painting. Where is it going to show up? I don't know. I don't know. It's impossible for me to gauge that. It's impossible for me to look into the future and say, yeah, that's the sort of work that I'm going to do. All I know is that I'm opening the door. That's all I can do. And I'm going to tell Jack Kirby, come on in. I'm super glad to have you. Welcome to my home. And if I let his work in, I'm sure that at some point, Something about his work is going to help me grow and it's going to help me construct these new paintings. What it is, I don't know. What are they going to look like? Who knows? But again, that first wonderful step is just saying, I want to let you in and I want to see what happens. Um, I think this is the case for one of the artists that I immediately thought of as soon as I decided to make like a elongated hand, very gestural hand. I was like, okay elongated gestural hand that can only mean one thing in all of drawing history and that's Egon Schiele. Schiele is probably I mean arguably he's one of the most talented draftspeople in art history period. He's one of the most recognizable draftspeople in art history for sure. I mean that's not even debatable. You can spot an Egon Schiele drawing from miles away and he for example has influenced a ton of Painters, illustrators, draftspeople, I mean, through generations, through generations. One of the most incredible things about Schiele was that he consciously decided to start viewing drawing, understanding drawing, not as an instance in the execution of a painting, let's say. So it was not drawing as process, which is beautiful, by the way. There's nothing wrong about that. But this was drawing as final expression. Your drawing was your goal. Drawing was your identity. And this was not common. I mean, nowadays, if we speak like that, we go like, what do you mean? That is so normal. We understand that when we do drawings, that's a language in and of itself. But that wasn't true a century ago. So Shelia was one of the first people that consciously said, this is going to be my path. That's why if you look at his paintings slash drawings, just his work, let's call it his work. I mean, there's obviously some that would fall onto the categories of drawings that are just charcoals, crayons, and paper. But when you see his paintings, for example, you don't know if they're drawn paintings or painted drawings. And it doesn't matter, honestly. We could argue for hours and hours and hours just trying to identify what things are and trying to place them in categories. And that serves no purpose, I feel. <laughs> It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. I mean, in his work, everything is like intertwined together. That's all we need to know. But we don't need to call it anything else. You know, if you want to call it a drawing, that's fine. If you want to call it a painting, that's fine. But as I was saying, he's had such a big influence on artists. And for example, artists that I admire. Because if you think about, let's say, Kent Williams' drawings. I mean, they would not exist if it wasn't for Egon Schiele. The drawings of Ashley Wood, 
they would not exist if it wasn't for Egon Schiele. The drawings of Dave McKean, they would not exist if it wasn't for Egon Schiele. A lot of the gesture that is in Phil Hale, it wouldn't exist if it wasn't for Egon Schiele. Egon Schiele is just the source of wonderful, very powerful kinetic energy that can be almost overwhelming, I feel. He's such a powerful, powerful drafts person that he can consume you. If you don't pay attention and you adore Egon Schiele and you want to learn from him, you're going to end up drawing like Egon Schiele. I mean, like a very bastardized version of Egon Schiele because nobody can draw like Egon Schiele. Let's make that clear, even though that's obvious. So we have to pay attention. If you want to do a self-portrait signing with your hands, a la Egon Schiele, it is going to be referential. You could call it appropriation. That's all good. But we have to be careful that our source, our inspiration, doesn't become so overpowering that we don't show up. Like I was saying, we, we have no place in our paintings. Now, our paintings, our drawings, our work, it is our work. It has to speak about us. And it's perfectly fine if we want to devote, you know, a couple of drawings or a couple of paintings to show how much admiration we have for somebody else. But if that consumes our work, if that starts to become the essence of our work, being constantly referential, I don't know. I think that that's, um, like I said, like a wasted opportunity. You know, in the same sense, I refer to those paintings where I just didn't have the courage to tackle hands and I still executed years of paintings. To me, those were wasted opportunities to learn something about myself. And that's exactly how I feel when you let somebody in, you know, like I said, I'm going to let Jack Kirby in. But when you let somebody in, somebody that has like a huge personality like Egon Schiele, and that personality just devours you and you start forgetting who you are and you start convincing yourself that you share so much with this person that it is only natural that your work is going to echo their work constantly. I feel that from time to time, we have to check ourselves for me, when I was younger, when I was doing comic books, for example, I adored Bart Sears because we used to get, they were hard to get, but we used to get wizard magazines, you know, when I was younger. Bart Sears pretty much taught me a ton of stuff that I didn't know about comic books and drawing and anatomy. And he was so overpowering, like in my early career, that I remember when I started at SVA, people started calling me Bart. I was like, yeah, that's cool, but that's not cool because... Even at an early age, when I was 17, 18, I don't want his quote-unquote style to just be part of everything that I do. So much so that, you know, I even lose my name. So one thing is to build on somebody's findings and experiences, and you keep constructing this ladder. You are finding a way to push something forward. I mean, let's call it forward. I don't know why we have to call it forward. It is not as if we are going to be better and better and better every single time. What is important about all of this is self-recognition. And the path of self-recognition is not necessarily a path of taking you further in the terms of bettering yourself as an artist. You know, you're not going to paint better when you're 80 than when you were in your 40s. You're probably going to know more, and you're probably going to have a richer relationship with, for example, in my case, with painting. I imagined myself as an old person just feeling like, you know, I have lived my whole life alongside and it has been my company forever. It's going to be for sure the longest relationship, you know, if I live long enough, hopefully, but it is going to be the longest relationship with this tool that teaches me about myself. And I'm so looking forward to experiencing those moments when I'm very old and seeing how the definition of painting has changed in my life, how visually the images that I produced have changed dramatically, I feel, in 40 years, I hope everything changes about painting. I'm so excited to see where painting is headed. I'm going to love to be part of that world. So why are we talking so much about this? Because when I wanted to do this hand, when I wanted to do these elongated fingers, to outstretch this hand and to make it like super, super expressive, Egon Schiele just showed up. As soon as you do an outstretched, semi-bony finger, it's like saying Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Like you're going to invoke Egon Schiele. Schiele is going to appear from thin air. So my worry was like, okay, try to be careful. It's almost like you're walking on eggshells. Yes, you demonstrate your love for a Schiele hand, 
but it has to be your painting. Your sensibility has to remain inside this painting. You have to express that love through your painting. And we emphasize your in that phrase. Because if not, then I feel that all these four prior paintings that we've poured our soul into were for nothing. I mean, if we've done four paintings where we're tackling these hands, where we're enjoying them, we're learning so much about our own hand. These are not just hands. These are our own hands. This is the way we express through our own hands. So there's so much of us in this exercise that it would have been sad to finish it off by handing it to somebody else, you know, by saying, hey, you take this, you bring this home, Sheila. No, that wouldn't have been cool. So we had to find a way, like a, a nice balance, a nice happy medium there where, yes, we want to insert ourselves into this contextual conversation that, of course, we know of Sheila's wonderful hands. I mean, honestly, I'm having a hard time thinking of another artist that would have as recognizable hands as Sheila's. He is so powerful, again, so overpowering that you can spot him from space, you know, if you look down on Earth. So that was super important for today. And hopefully I was able to channel enough of who I am into these hands and to be faithful, even though, I mean, they are distorted, but to be faithful to my shapes, my forms, and the gestures that my hand can make, that, yes, it's a love letter to many painters, many wonderful draftspeople out there, but in the end, it is my love letter. That's going to be it for today. So we have an announcement. Um, we thought about it, and we would have had to work ridiculously hard. I mean, absurdly hard, because the schedule just doesn't really lend itself for that. Because next week, I'll be off to Rome to do my workshop, and I'm going to be there for two weeks. So there's not going to be any videos for a little bit. But we planned it so, you know, as soon as I get back, and I think I'm going to get back on the, let me check... I'm going to be back the week of the 19th, July 19th. So as soon as I get back, Danny is going to have videos ready for that week that we're working really hard on. So I know this seems like a long time, but it's finally summer. Things are opening up. You guys deserve a break. And as soon as we come back, we're going to be super, super happy doing what we love. So maybe take this time to catch up with videos that you haven't viewed or go back to viewing old favorites if you have some of those. And we'll see you guys on the uh, 19th. As we say on Fridays, Danny and I are super grateful for your company. And we hope that you give us a chance on July 19th. And let us be your company once again, even if it's for 15, 20 minutes a day. So we'll see you guys. Have a great break. Love you guys. Bye.